We'll take a little bit of a detour from Job this morning because of one of the questions that came up last week as we were talking about Satan having a seat at the table, so to speak, in God's senior staff meetings and how God runs the world. And we talked about God being responsible for our suffering, that God is ultimately responsible if his greatest desire, if his will were not for us to suffer, we would not suffer. That is the nature of God's sovereignty. And things lined up really well in that the sermon passage today in the crucifixion, John's telling of the crucifixion, the actual moments of Jesus hanging on the cross, all the authors writing the gospels in unique ways, telling the same story, same truths, but adding their own kind of perspective and their intent based on who their audience is, John's is very much about the sovereignty of God. John's emphasis, I know, the boiling water is done. It sings a happy song. No, don't try to stop it. It'll sing a second verse. It's bad. Uh, John's emphasis is very much on God's control over the events of the crucifixion. And the way that John proves that out is by showing you how many aspects of what are taking place were fulfilled or were fulfillments of scripture. And so John will say over and over and over again throughout that passage so that the scripture could be fulfilled. And obviously that's true of the big things. Everybody grants that, that God wanted his people to be saved and so he saved his people. But John is very much making the point of, no, 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 the reason that his garments were divided the reason that he was naked on the cross, the reason that his bones were not broken, the reason that he died when he did, the reason that blood and water spilled out of his side, all of these things, these tiny, insignificant details, were that the scriptures would be fulfilled. And what that has to mean is that all of those things were, in fact, the unchangeable will of God, that God from all eternity purposed, willed, desired, whatever word you want to use, for those things to happen. And that is why they happen. That's tough when we're talking about suffering. It's tough when we're talking about hardship and heartbreaking things and difficulty that it would be God's will. And the question that came up last week as we were discussing this in the context of Satan was, well, what do we mean by the phrase, the will of God? What are we talking about when we say that? And how how clear is scripture that God gets what he wills? And how do we reconcile that with the idea that surely it's God's will that I would be obedient to his law? But I don't know if you guys have noticed. I'm actually sure you guys have noticed. I'm a lawbreaker pretty regularly. <laughs> so how do you reconcile that God always gets what he wills with the fact that God wills for me to be obedient and doesn't happen? Happens sometimes, occasionally doesn't happen all the time. Certainly, in my case, doesn't happen even as much as it should. I've mentioned several times, I know a lot of you have read it, Kevin DeYoung's little book, Just Do Something. This is a fantastic book. And it is about Christians finding the will of God. How do I know if what I'm doing is what God wants me to be doing? How do I get out of this uh, situation a lot of Christians get in, which is that they are paralyzed in decision making. They cannot decide what to do because they are afraid that the thing they might be doing is outside of God's will. And if they do it, bad stuff's gonna happen. And that's what the book is about. That's not what I wanna talk about this morning. But in the book, his second chapter is called The Will of God in Christianese. And it is the best, I mean, you see, these aren't even real size pages. This is a very small book. It is the best probably 10 pages that I have ever read on just helpfully and clearly describing what is the will of God and the different ways that we use that phrase. It's eight pages, that chapter. So what I'm gonna to do today is talk about that, blend in some scripture reading so that we have additional scriptural support, not to make the conclusion that he's making at the end of that chapter because his purpose is different than, than ours, but for the purposes of Job to make sure that we are all firmly established in the scriptural truth that God is actually sovereign 
and that there is a kind of his will, a type of will that we'll describe that will happen. God's will be done is not a hopa hopa. It is a it will happen. God's will will be done. And I want us to see that from scripture and I want we'll use uh, De Young's terms here because it'll help give us a little more understanding. So I said the purpose of, of his book and the purpose of this chapter in his book is that there are a lot of decisions we have to make in the Christian life where we want to make those decisions in accord with the will of God. We want to know what God wants for us and we want to do that thing. And we talk about it in very diff in, in different terms, but we'll say things like, I don't want to be outside the will of God. You know, if when we say things like, I feel God leading me to do such and such, or God directing me to do such and such, we're making an assertion about his will. It's God's will that I would do this thing. That's what we mean when we say, I feel God leading me, or I, I, I think this is what God wants me to do. And it's reasonable then that if that's what we want to do, we're very eager to know what is God's will for our lives. And that phrase, the will of God, is one of the most confusing phrases. Uh, De Young says it's one of the, it is the most confusing phrase in the Christian vocabulary because of the different ways that we use it. Sometimes when we talk about God's will, we're talking about being obedient and doing the will of God, doing the thing that God calls us to do. You look at the Ten Commandments, they seem to be a pretty clear expression of God's will. God does want us to serve him and him alone and does not want us to bow down to other gods. He does want us to worship him on the terms that he dictates. He does not want us to create uh, idols or images or, or human inventions and worship him through those things. He does want us to use his name with reverence and honor and carefulness, thoughtfulness. He does not want us to be callously indifferent to the way that we use the name or the words uh, descriptions of God and so on and so forth. That is one easy way to talk about God's will. What ought we to do? What does God want us to do? That's a will of God question. But other times we talk about like what I was talking about a minute ago, sort of finding the will of God. There's not a scripture as clear about whether or not I should take this job or that job as there is about whether or not I should worship this God or that God. The scripture is pretty clear about which God. It's not very clear about which job, which car, which house, which school, even, even super important, which spouse? Do I marry this person? Those are meaningful questions. We want to be obedient to the will of God in those things, but I can't just go to scripture and turn to page 856 of my Bible and see this plan God has for my life all laid out where if I'll just follow these steps, I'll live in his blessing and in his will and everything good will happen. Um, so we use that phrase in those different ways. But we also use the phrase, the will of God, in a third way. And the third way is the one that scripture talks about the most. And the scripture, uh, that, that's the way that is most relevant for the book of Job and what we're going to be talking about. And this is what's called God's will of decree. God's will of decree. Uh, the terms do matter a little bit here just because we're using the same phrase over and over again, will of God. And so having the clarity of what kind of will, will of decree, is going to be helpful for us to understand which one we're talking about. And God's will of decree is everything that he has ordained, or as the confessions say, whatsoever comes to pass. Everything that happens, happens because, and you can remember how we talked about God governs his universe. It's not in the simplistic way of a religion like Islam, where he lets the universe run sort of on its own terms, and every now and then God will intervene directly with his creation to do something else or make what he wants to happen happen. That's not Christianity. Christianity is everything that happens is what God wants to happen, and the way he makes it happen far more often than direct intervention is means all these different things your decisions, your prayers. We talked about Satan and the angels and, and the work that they have in this. He uses nature itself. He uses all of these means that are doing stuff. They are, if they're sentient, like humans and supernatural beings, they are choosing to do those things. And everything that is happening based on what they're doing is God's will of decree. 
That's the whatsoever comes to pass. Everything that happens is God's will of decree. And that's why this is challenging for us in the book of Job, because so much bad happens. And it's challenging for us in our own lives and the darkest points, because how in the world could this be what God wanted? Because when we get to that, we start thinking about the character of God and we move. And it's okay. I'm not saying it's wrong to make this connection, but we move from sort of some abstract decree. I could see how in a vacuum, the Lord could be glorified through horrible situations. We could see that. We're generally theologically mature enough to, but my horrible situation, (laughs) why would he want that? Why would that be the way he wants to do it? That's the harder question. But we have to begin with the fact that, yeah, it is, in a, in a very real sense, what he wanted. Because it's what he decreed. Every single thing that happens is part of this will of decree. And none of his purposes can be thwarted. Nothing that he wants to happen can be stopped from happening by creatures. It's back to what we talked about the last couple weeks. All of this rides on the creator-creature distinction. You have to get it in your brains that whatever we are, God is categorically other. (laughs) And there is no restraint. And whatever the angels are, God is categorically other because they are still creatures. And so they cannot thwart his purposes. He is absolutely sovereign over all things. St. Augustine said, the will of God is the necessity of all things. The necessity of all things. What must be true in order for something to happen? God must will it. Period. Full stop. There can be lots of other things because God uses means. But for anything to happen, what must be part of the equation is that God willed it to be. That's what it means for God to be sovereign. Now, that can be a lot to bite off. So let's dig into some passages of Scripture to make sure that this is what the Scriptures teach, because this is going to be emotionally tough to swallow at times. And so if it's not clearly what Scripture teaches, let's not believe it. (laughs) Uh, Now, we did show a couple weeks ago, the alternatives are all worse. As bad as this is emotionally, The alternatives are all worse. But let's do a little bit of digging and and see what scripture says this. And I want you especially to pay attention because we're going to do a lot of scripture right now. I want you to especially pay attention to the different ways that scripture makes the same point. Because a lot of times when we are trying to work our way around this doctrine, when we're looking at something terrible, And we're trying to protect God from himself, which he does not need our help doing. But we're trying to protect God's reputation. We're trying to not blame God for our suffering. We'll get real creative with our language. We will we'll use different phrases that are just slightly tweaked. And we'll say, well, yes, it's the will of God, but blah, 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 blah. And as we listen to all these scriptures, I want you to hear how comprehensively the Holy Spirit has employed in this case, the English language to cut off that option from us of just wordsmithing our way around this doctrine. Who's got Psalm 115.3? Kate? Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. Psalm 135.6. Whatever the Lord pleases, he does in heaven and on earth. But what about the places in between, right? Those are the places where God doesn't do what he wills. Other than the heavens and the earth, the seas and everything in between. Other than that, see see the problem here? Who's got Proverbs 16.33? I do. The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Well, now, wait a minute. We've all been told growing up that God doesn't care about games of chance. I mean, it's not like God is sovereignly ordaining what number the dice fall on when you roll them. Oh, wait. Literally what it says. Who's got Proverbs 19.21? I do. Many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So again, now we're on the more significant things. We're not just casting dice and games of chance. 
the plans of your heart. You, you have your plans. You work out things very often according to your own plans. We do what we want to do. And when we do the things we want to do, what are we also doing? The Lord's purpose, which prevails. He's got Proverbs 20, 24. A man's steps are from the Lord. How then can man understand his way? In Hebrew, that is the word ordained. A man's steps are ordained by the Lord. Is the It's the same uh, in the Septuagint. That's the, the translation we use there. And in Proverbs 21, 1. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he will. And we love verses like that. We love to believe in that kind of sovereignty, that even big, powerful people are ultimately serving the Lord's purposes, even if they're opposed to him, that no one is in power, that God did not put in power, and that even when things look bad that other people are doing and that they're causing, God is sovereign over that and working his purposes in it. We don't like it when it hits a little more close to home, <laughs> but we're good with it when it's kings and powers and principalities and, and things, but it's all the same. A man's steps are ordained by the Lord. The king's heart are like channels of water. Think about that. You think about water moves freely. We tell our kids when they go to the ocean and uh, you know the waves are pretty tough and there's a little bit of risk there. And I try to remind them that we should fear the ocean because it doesn't care if we live or die. <laughs> you, know, you will get that one wave. Like, yeah, you go out there to go body surfing and the one wave crushes you and you're like, well, that was kind of fun. And then you stand up to kind of catch your breath and reorient. And the ocean doesn't care that you're catching your breath and reorienting. It'll hit you with another one and knock you down. It doesn't care whether you live or die. Water has this great power and freedom, but we know that water moves where it is channeled. And that's what God says he does with the king's hearts. He sets the channels of where that water will move. They go according to his purposes. Uh, Pam, I think you have Job 14.5. Yep. Since his days are determined and the number of his months is with you, and you have appointed his limits that he cannot pass. Well, that's all. That's all God's saying. Yeah. <laughs> right? Simple enough. Um, his days are determined. Its limits are set, and you cannot exceed the limit that God has set for your life. Not possible. Can't be done. How about Isaiah 43, 12 and 13? I declared and saved and proclaimed, when there was no strange God among you, and you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Also, henceforth I am he. There is none who can deliver from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? Any questions? <laughs> I mean, really, it's 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 the terrifying power and sovereignty of God. Who can turn it back? Now, it's terrifying if you would think it's only terrifying if you're on the adversarial side of the equation. That God's enemies ought to be really, really scared because who can turn his hand back? Who could do something different? And you would think, back to our discussion of, I keep pointing to this because it's where the Job chapter one notes were. I'm sure you can all use your photographic memories to return them. You would think, and what Job begins with is Job being a good man and a great man. The person who is righteous and a follower of God gets great things and greatness. That's the world the way we think it ought to be. And so our minds immediately run to passages like this and the idea that, well, good, if we're on the favored side of God's equation, nothing bad could ever happen to us because God is sovereign. And then it turns out that God has purposes in the suffering, that it is a tool in his hand that he uses even with those he loves. Scripture says plainly that God disciplines, reproves the ones that he loves. We know that's not what's specifically happening in Job's case. Job is having uh, faith tested by Satan to prove the glory of God, that God uh, do, do, not only deserves to be loved in and of himself, but there are those who love God in and of themselves because God has given them faith. But the point is still the same, that 
that God uses all of these mechanisms in the accomplishment of his purposes. And if our view is so simplistic that God can only use happy mechanisms, blessing mechanisms, and God cannot use pain, suffering, turmoil, toil mechanisms, we're creating a pretty weak God. We think we're creating a good God. But our definition of good will be wrong, and that's what Job's going to challenge a lot. Uh, how about Isaiah 45, 7? I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Did you hear that? Yeah. He makes well-being, and he respects our freedom so much that when other people create calamity, he chooses not to pull it back. Is that what you read? Not quite. Did you read that one again then? Because I, I think I definitely got confused. No, it's that he creates calamity. Whew. That's tough. And then the next one, uh, one more from Isaiah 46.10. Um, looks like it starts with the word declaring the end from the beginning. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Declaring, God is declaring the end from the beginning. Not seeing, not cognizant of what will happen, not God has a simple awareness of the future, declaring it, and then he calls all of it in the very next sentence, my purposes. Everything he declares is his purpose, his will, and it will be accomplished. He calls it my good pleasure. Ah, a world that, that goes into rebellion against God, a world where sinners and rebels shake their angry hands, bring a curse on the creation, and even when given the offer of redemption, many turn their back. A world where many who do, by God's grace, receive that redemption by faith and love God and follow God still have their stuff break and their friends die and their money run out. That world is what God calls my good pleasure. Oh, that's why Job's so hard. That's why I said at the end of last week, we're going to hate this book. We're going to love this book. And we're going to hate this book. But that point is what makes it so hard. How about Lamentations 3, 37 and 38? Who has spoken and it came to pass, unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High, the good and bad come? Pretty clear, right? Both good and ill go forth. From where? From the mouth of God. How about um, Romans 9, 11? Though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Stop. I know that's just the middle of a very important phrase, and all of us New Testament Romans lovers are cringing that I'm not letting him finish. But <laughs> that's the point I want to make. One of our counter arguments is this idea that God knows it, but doesn't cause it. God knows Jacob will be lovable and Esau won't mm, not sure you've done your Old Testament homework there but theoretically God knows one will follow God and one will reject God and that's why God chose one and not the other and yet the first that's exactly the opposite of the point Paul is making the very point Paul is making is nope before either one had done anything good or bad for the very purpose of establishing God as sovereign over all things, including faith and belief. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what happens with, with them, uh, with these brothers. And so that, that's tough. Uh, and then how about 2 Timothy 1 9? Who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began? The New Testament has a lot to say about Christian faith, <clears throat> about what is required of us to receive Christ, to believe Christ, to hear his voice and to follow his voice, to believe that God is who he says he is 
and did what he said he would do and will continue to do what he said he will do. The New Testament has a lot to say about Christian faith and, and what we have to do out of our hearts and our desires and our purposes. It has a lot that it places on us. And every single thing it places on us comes after what God does in us for no purpose other than that he wanted to. Why one and not the other? Go back to Romans 9. Again, I'm not expecting this to be emotionally easy in our minds. Scripture doesn't either. It deals with this in very complicated ways. Uh, but we can't deny what Scripture is saying here again and again. From the, from the chance rolling of die to the who will be saved. From the king to the every person. From the heavens to the earth to the seas, to everything in between. In every where you go, in space and in time, and every type of decision and action that occurs in every human life, behind it is this will of God's decree. Uh, did I give out Ephesians 1, 11? Yes. Let's do that one now. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So I saved that one for last, and De Young uses it first in his book. It's very much a go-to text on this. I saved it for last because it actually has the word predestined in it. And when you're a Presbyterian minister teaching on these things, people expect you to just harp in on the word predestined because, you know, that's what we are. We have an entire class on that in school. Uh, but now that we've read all of those other scriptures, it does make Ephesians 1.11 seem pretty plain and straightforward, doesn't it? Our salvation, predestined. Why? How can we say that? Why? Because all things work according to the counsel of his will. Why would this be any different? Paul's expectation writing to the Ephesians and what he knows they already believe or should believe is that all things work according to the counsel of his will. And what they're struggling with is this particular issue. And so he says, well, doesn't it fit inside the all things? <laughs> yes, yes, in fact, it does. It is one of the all things. Every human, this is me quoting De Young. Uh, actually, I, I, I struggle with this because it's so much about, about what the sermon is about today, so I don't want to go a bunch into detail just because it'll be duplication. Um, but Acts 4, 27 and 28 says, For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And here's what DeYoung says. He says, Every human lamentation and woe must look to the cross. From there we see the problem of evil answered, not in some theoretical sense, but by pointing us to an all-powerful God who works all things for good. Shocking as it sounds, the most heinous act of evil and injustice ever perpetrated on the earth took place according to to the counsel of God's gracious and predetermined will. And that is, he's right that we have to run to the cross, which sounds like a cop-out in Christianity, right? We always say, What's, well, the answer is Jesus, right? Just go. But it doesn't have to be a trivial answer. It can be a very significant and impactful answer because if I struggle to believe that this horrible thing that happened in my life is according to the predetermined will of God, and I do, I do struggle to believe that. I then have to turn to the cross and say, well, was the cross worse than what happened to me? And sometimes I feel like they're close, but if I'm being objective, the cross was worse. Jesus was the holy innocent one. He was the perfect spotless lamb. The trial, was, he came to save his people from their sins. He came to his own, the promised Messiah, and his people did not know him. The true light was coming into the world. And his people did not know him. And then they killed him. They accused him and they killed him. It's insanity. It is evil. It is the worst evil. The most unjust 
unjust thing in the history of the world. And you can believe that your adversity is a close second. And I will grant you that, but it is a close second. It is not first. It is the most evil and unjust thing that has ever happened in the world was the innocent one being slain. And yet, we don't struggle for one minute to believe that that was God's sovereign will and his purposes. And the way John especially writes his account of these events, he's making you come to terms with that conclusion. That all the stuff, of course the big stuff, salvation, but the little stuff, what he's wearing, what happens to his clothes, why is he naked, why is he hung on a cross, why does he die so quickly? That's a very unusually quick death for someone to be hung on a cross. It should have taken longer because oh, his bones weren't broken. And the guys who weren't dead yet got their bones broken. And the scripture said, not a bone was broken. And then, and then why, even though you can get into some of the really, I mentioned it in the sermon, but the what killed Jesus, whereas normally you die in crucifixion of asphyxiation. You can't breathe because it takes all of your strength to but as you look at the biblical text, and now with what we know about modern medicine, it doesn't seem like that's what happened with Jesus. One, it would have taken a lot longer. But there's a giant clue that comes from the spear piercing his side and water and blood flowing out, which is very weird. There should not be water flowing out of a human body when you stab it in the side, unless their heart exploded, basically. Because the pericardial sac has ionized water, some fancy water, I don't understand. <laughs> but for someone just observing, if your heart explodes and you get stabbed here, blood, dark red, and clear liquid, like water, is what will flow out. And then you go back to the very same psalm that we're all comfortable with, Psalm 69, there are multiple ones, that mention these little details that we can connect to the cross. And the one of them that I'll connect in the sermon is, we all know the one about they gave him vinegar for his thirst. Well, the verse right before that is about the heart exploding. And we never think about that one literally in this context, but we take the next one very literally. Because David, in those, David's just describing. David's doing what we do. David is lamenting. David is using, hyperbole sounds like he's lying or an insult. He's using... The same language we would all use to describe, to try to describe the depths of inner turmoil. We don't say, yeah, I feel, I felt pretty sad inside when that happened. We say, it felt like my heart was ripped out of my chest. Well, was your heart ripped out of your chest? No. But we know what you meant. It's a good way to describe it. So David is writing these songs where he's saying, effectively, my heart just blew up within my body. And you think, oh, yeah, okay, I get what he's doing there. That's poetic language. And then you look at Jesus and what happened? His heart blew up within his body. The little details of Jesus' death declared by God from all eternity, but even for our sake, declared 1,000 years before, 600 years before, because he's sovereign over the big ones and the little ones, and his purposes cannot be thwarted. Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. We think about God having a book, the Lamb's book of life, of who will inherit the kingdom. So at least God knows who's going to be saved and he's not surprised. God's book is a little more detailed than that. God's book is... And whatsoever shall come to pass. That's God's book. And he wrote it. Again, emotionally challenging for us. That's why we're going to go through the study of Job together, to work through that with Job and with his friends, because that's what they have to do. But we can't start Job with a deficient view of God's sovereignty, with an unbiblical view of God's sovereignty. We've got to start Job with what God has said about himself in terms of his will. Uh, Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I accomplish all my purposes. God knows all things, 
because he sovereignly superintends all things. It's the other way of what we think. We think that, that God knows them because they're going to be. They're going to be because he knows them. <laughs> That's why they are. Again, back to the Augustine quote, it's what lies beneath whatsoever comes to pass is the will of God. So then there's the other side of that coin, the, what, what de Jong calls God's will of desire. And that's what God has commanded, what he desires from his creatures, what he wants us to do. So the way de Jong says it, which I think is very clever, which is if the will of decree is how things are, the will of desire is how they ought to be. The world that ought to be, the world that is like the nature of God, is the world where everyone believes, everyone has faith, everything is obedient, there is no sin, there is no unrighteousness, everybody recognizes God as God and serves him accordingly. That's the world that will be when Christ comes at the consummation. We just don't like the fact that God, instead of creating a world that was always and only and ever just in that state, he created a world that fell out of that state and had to be redeemed back toward it. And so I do think part of our struggle, that part of what we need to think about in our struggle with the will of God is that we, the things that we re resent about the way God runs the world are ultimately a resentment of redemption. God wanted to redeem, and a world that did not fall needs no redemption, has no redemption. God's desire was to redeem. And everything that he does in this world until the consummation, he tells us, this Romans 8, 28, is for the working out of that redemptive purpose. We can, we can hate the things that happen. We can hate some of the means that God uses to bring about his purposes. But we should think real carefully about hating redemption or the God who desired to redeem. Because it's a, what did we say at the, the very first sentence, the very first chapter, the very first conversation we had about Job? What must God be about? His own glory. Anything less is not a God. Anything less is, is absurd that a God would prioritize something over his own glory is not impressive humility. It's an admission that he's not God. And that's tough. So those are the two types of God's will that you see in the Bible. This is the, the will of desire is the one you read about a lot. I mean, the Ten Commandments express God's will of desire. If you read uh, the Apostle John's epistles, you think about 1 John and how much he's telling us in that not to love the world, not to love the things of the world, not to, to obey God's commandments. That's God's will of desire, what he wants for his people to do, the way the world ought to be. That's not the way he unchangeably has ordained things to be. And we know that because, back to the beginning of today's lesson, I'm not obedient a lot. <laughs> I disobey. And it's against God's will of desire that I disobey. He's told me I ought to obey. But do you really think that I, I mean, as highly as I think of myself, even I recognize that I cannot do things that are outside of God's ordained will, his will of decree. I just don't have that much power. And we see here at the beginning of Job that Satan has to show up at the meeting. Satan has to answer God's questions. Satan is going to be completely under God's control in terms of what he can do and when he can do it and how he can do it and how much. Completely. You know why? Because even Satan can't do one thing outside of the will of decree. Again, we struggle emotionally. I understand it. But we've got to approach Job with a biblical, clear-headed view of God's sovereignty. And then, as I mentioned, just to tie off that chapter, what de Young's 
point is for this book and for that chapter is a third type of God's will, which the Bible never even talks about. It's what he calls the, what de Young calls God's will of direction, which is just the, does God want me to take this job or that job? Does God want me to buy this house or that house, this car or that car? That's the will of God we obsess over and the Bible doesn't speak to it. <laughs> the Bible is very focused on the other two. What we, what we ought to do, because it's the desire of God, what will happen, because it's the decree of God, and in everything else, there's a bunch of freedom and liberty and good conscience, do what you want. If it doesn't disobey God's clear law, his revealed will, and it makes sense for you, do it and move on. That's why the book is, ready? Just do something. <laughs> but that's not what this is about. We're about God's will of decree because we're about the book of Job right now and it's gonna to be tough for us. So what questions do we have? I hope I overwhelmed you with scripture and not with my own words because the testimony of scripture is overwhelming. It is consistent, it is, it is massive. It's an easy one. Um, the confession also uses, the Westminster Confession uses the phrase, yet not the author of evil. Yeah. How do we reconcile that if God is sovereign over all things that happen, then how is he not the author of sin or evil? But he's not, I think it's a sin. Yeah. Well, we have to start the same place we start with God's sovereignty, which we struggle to reconcile with human freedom. And so we say, well, why do I have to believe in this kind of sovereignty? No matter, like, I really struggle to reconcile it. So why am I even struggling? Why don't I just get up? Well, it's because I just read you 200 scriptures that speak to God's sovereignty. It is what God says, my struggle to reconcile notwithstanding. Does scripture have anything to say about God and whether or not he's the author of evil? It has a ton to say, right? He's light, there's no darkness in him. He can't fellowship with sin. Satan is the father of lies. He draws this vast, it's a scripture we could make just as long a list where scripture says it is absolutely the case that God is not the author of sin. No matter how much I struggle to reconcile everything I just said about God's sovereignty with what scripture says that God is not the author of sin, I'm in exactly the same place, which is, am I gonna believe scripture or not? And this isn't one of those good and necessary consequence things in scripture. Well, well, you kind of reason to that from some of these verses that are a little vague. Or the, No, no, the verses are real, real clear. This is the way it is. So my, my strongest answer to the question of the problem of evil and whether or not God owns that is that scripture says both things are true. God is not the author of sin. There is no dwelling of, of evil, of sin, not even a, a shadow of it, a hint of it within God. And every single thing that happens, including the sin that you willingly and freely choose, is part of his will of decree. And if you are, if you're discussing this point with someone who does not believe what scripture says, you will never give them a satisfying answer to this question. This is not one where I can just draw three logical points on the board and show you, look, if you just walk them through this argument, they will be persuaded. This is an argument of the heart. This is one that the Lord and the Lord alone can break down because he says that these things are true. And to accept that they're true requires faith. But it also requires the renewal of the mind thing that the Holy Spirit does. And it requires the self-awareness and repentance that the Holy Spirit brings us. Because only by God's grace can you answer this question honestly. Have you ever sinned against your will? Has there ever been a sin that you really, really, really didn't want to do it? You didn't choose it. It just happened. You know that you own every sin that you have ever committed. So even if it is also true, and it is, that in God's decrees from all eternity, that sin was determined, it doesn't really let you off the hook, does it? Because with the awareness that the Holy Spirit brings in conviction, 
you can't honestly blame God for making you do something you didn't want to do. You have to say, yeah, I did what I wanted to do. God may also be sovereign, and I really did what I wanted to do. I mean, that's the, the phrase y'all hear me use so much that I use for dramatic effect. You've never in your life done anything you didn't want to do. Ever. No human being has ever done anything they didn't want to do. And you say, oh, that's not true. I didn't want to take Calc 3 in college, but it was a prerequisite and they made me. Okay. <laughs> but you signed up for the class and went to it and chose that major and chose that school and chose not to leave, right? Well, I didn't want to give the criminal my, my credit cards. He had a gun to my head. I didn't want to. Uh, okay, but you took it out of your back pocket and you handed, yeah, so he wouldn't shoot me. Huh? You wanted to give him your wallet more than you wanted to get shot? I'm sympathetic to that. You've never in your life done anything you didn't want to do. And part of where we'll get when Job gets a little ornery with God and has to get his, uh, his mindset right here is that Job starts to believe the narrative that He's somehow a passive victim of the world and its circumstances, and God owes him more than this. It's like, well, what? What are you talking about? And we go even a step further than Job, and we say, "Why? Well, no, I did. I didn't deserve that. I didn't do. I didn't." Like, what are you talking about? What? 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 What world do you live in? where you are not complicit in your own sin. This is what all of the, you know, I'm a, a musical theater person. This is what all the musical theater productions about the gospel stories get wrong. Jesus Christ Superstar, Godspell, they both treat both Jesus and Judas as if they have no freedom. They're not choosing any of this. They're just puppets in a master design that God is working out. And that's because when an unregenerate mind tries to make sense of the gospel story and take any of it as historically true, that's what you have to come up with, is that they must be puppets. They can't have chosen this if God knew it was going to happen. And it's tough. It's tough to reconcile. And we have to go back to sometimes... I hope you understand what I mean when I say this. Sometimes I emotionally cannot reconcile them. In a given situation, I don't have the emotional capacity or the intellectual willingness to reconcile them. I don't want to believe that God ordained this. And all I can do then is go back to the cross. Not to try and persuade myself that if I make this logical argument from the cross, I'll feel better about it. I won't feel better about it. It'll take time. <laughs> but at least by going to the cross, I can see the same kind of situation where God was so clearly working for my good and redemptive purposes and so clearly working out of love. And that gives me something. Because apart from that, I got nothing. I got nothing but sad and sometimes mad. Well, how is it? Job the passive when in this situation it was God testing. Yeah, I didn't say that carefully enough. Okay. It, it, what brings about Job's suffering, he is in a sense passive. Okay. Once we get later in the book when Job is arguing with God and sort of doing these mental gymnastics around the way he would run the world and the way the world ought to be, oh, okay. that's when Job gets okay, yeah. sideways. So that's a, that's a good catch. I didn't say that carefully at all. Any last questions? I have one, but it may be a lot, maybe a lot, and that's just prayer, because you said God uses prayer to affect. It's one of his most significant means. Right, so... My friend Doug Kelly wrote a book on prayer that is pretty dry at the beginning and hard to get going, <laughs> just going to be honest. Um, Doug Kelly is that way, pretty dry at the beginning and hard to get going, and you hang in there and it will be the most profound things you've, you've ever heard by God's grace. But, but he makes the argument from scripture that there are cases where God intends blessings for his people. There are blessings that he's got like stored up in a warehouse, ready to pour out on his people. And the, and the flap that is preventing those blessings from falling out on his people is prayer. And until his people pray, those blessings will not be released. And scripture speaks that way 
which is consistent when we say God uses lots of means. God wants to bring about this calamity in Job's life. He uses Satan. Satan freely chooses to do the thing he wants to do. He, he, Satan is responsible. He, he picks this and does it in accordance with God's purposes, but he's a means. And Doug Kelly's book on prayer is really good at showing us how prayer is one of those means as well. It is a powerful tool. God didn't have to do it this way. God can snap his fingers and make stuff happen. But instead, somehow dot, 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 God's glory, <laughs> he decided to make prayer a link in the chain between what happens and him being glorified. And it's a great privilege for Christians to be able to pray. But we sit there spinning our wheels in prayers feeling like this does nothing. <laughs> no. yeah. we got to go back to the scriptures. Yeah. His will and, you know, yeah. the prayer makes You cannot yeah. change his will. Right. But it may very much be the case that his that the accomplishment of his will he designed to be tied to your prayers. 